I'm planning to vote. Are you? Nah, I don't vote. Christians shouldn't get involved in politics. Says who? Not God. The Bible says, choose for your tribe's wise, understanding, and experienced men. God wants us to choose leaders who will make decisions based on biblical principles. If Christians won't vote for the good of America, who will? Well, I don't like either candidate. And the one that I really like isn't even in the running. Hey, no one in authority is perfect, but there's always a better choice. Pray about it and vote the better choice. Listen, I can't be bothered to vote. Our country's a big mess and it's not going to get any better whether I vote or not. Have you ever read a history book? How do you think things get changed in our country? They get changed in the voting booth. Voting is not only our right, it's our responsibility. Hey, voting is a waste of time. My one vote doesn't make a difference. Did you know that there are 60 million Christians in our country who are eligible to vote? Take your one vote based on biblical values and multiply it by millions of other votes based on biblical values. And what do you get? You get a landslide. It starts with that one vote, yours. And don't forget that some elections have been decided by just a few hundred votes. Without your one vote, an important race could be lost. But I can't even get to the polls on election day. So it doesn't matter if I want to vote or not. Well, maybe there's someone out there who can help you get to the polls. Will anyone out there help a senior citizen or someone who's handicapped or needs a babysitter or doesn't have transportation or doesn't know where their polling place is? Anyone? Yes, I see those hands. Go ahead and offer to help. All right, I'm sold. I think I'll vote after all. Thanks. Hey, I'm planning to vote. Are you? Now, up next, we have Bishop Art Hodges. He has been all the way to the Supreme Court to fight for our religious liberties. And today, he will be talking about the differences in the Democratic and Republican platforms 2016 and 2020. In the interest of full disclosure, I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I call myself a Christocratican, <laughs> which means a biblical voter. Those of us with Judeo-Christian beliefs have a written platform on which we stand. It's called the Bible. Adhering to its non-negotiable moral values sets you on the path to becoming a biblical voter. Politics and elections are about right versus left. Pulpits and biblical voters are about right versus wrong. So align your vote to what is right in the Lord's sight. Frederick Douglass said, I have one great political idea. The best expression of it I have found in the Bible. It is in substance righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. This constitutes my politics the negative and positive of my politics, and the whole of my politics. Proverbs 29 and 2 says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Now it's true, we never in any election get to vote for the best candidate. That would be our own Lord Jesus Christ. But if you cannot conscientiously vote for the person running for the office, vote for their position, not for their personality. Now, let's get real. The next president of the United States of America and most statewide candidates will be elected from one of two political parties, the one to the right, the other to the left. The Republicans and Democrats have published party platforms. And the power of party platforms is that congressional members vote in line with their political party platforms 89 and 74 percent of the time, respectively. I decided to read these party platforms, something probably most people have never even begun to do. And in reading them, I discovered some amazing contrasts. For example, one party platform mentions the Bible, the other doesn't. One mentions divine, the other doesn't. One mentions creator, the other doesn't. One mentions prayer, the other doesn't. One mentions sing, the other doesn't. One mentions praise, the other doesn't. One mentions pastors, the other doesn't. One mentions Catholic, the other doesn't. One mentions preaching, the other doesn't. One mentions bipartisan, the other doesn't. One mentions fathers, the other doesn't. One mentions morality, the other doesn't. One mentions strong families, the other doesn't. One mentions religious liberty, the other doesn't. One mentions traditional family, the other doesn't. One mentions inalienable rights, 
The other doesn't. One mentions traditional marriage. The other doesn't. One mentions sanctity of human life. The other doesn't. One mentions traditional family values. The other doesn't. One mentions traditional religious beliefs. The other doesn't. One mentions our Judeo-Christian heritage. The other doesn't. One mentions the Declaration of Independence. The other doesn't. One mentions God bless America. The other doesn't. One mentions Christian eight times and Muslim one time. The other mentions Christian one time and Muslim eight times. Mm. One mentions praise two times and protest zero times. The other mentions protest four times and praise zero times. One mentions God 15 times and LGBT zero times. The other mentions God one time and LGBT 26 times. One mentions the Bible three times, the other zero. One mentions pastors three times, the other zero times. One mentions father six times, the other zero times. One mentions preaching two times, the other zero times. One mentions bipartisan eight times, the other zero times. One mentions religious liberty six times, the other zero times. One mentions inalienable rights ten times, the other zero times. One mentions rights of conscience six times, the other zero times. One mentions the Declaration of Independence four times, the other zero times. One affirms that the Bill of Rights lists religious liberty with its rights of conscience as the first freedom to be protected. The other does not even mention the U.S. Constitution's Bill of Rights at all. One mentions that our third president, Thomas Jefferson, declared, no provision in our Constitution ought to be clearer to man than that which protects the rights of conscience against the enterprises of the civil authority and affirms that our rights of conscience six times while the other makes no mention of rights of conscience at all. One party platform mentions faith 26 times, the other 11 times. One mentions church four times, the other one time. One affirms that our First Amendment rights are not given to us by the government, but are rights we inherently possess. The other does, does not. One affirms that government cannot use subsequent amendments to limit First Amendment rights. The other doesn't. One affirms that the free exercise clause is both an individual and a collective liberty, protecting a right to worship God according to the dictates of conscience. The other doesn't. One affirms the right of prayer in public school events. The other doesn't. One affirms that every time we sing, God bless America, we are asking for divine help so that our country can fulfill its promises. The other never asks for divine help. One party platform acknowledges the Bill of Rights, lists religious liberty as the first freedom protected. The other does not. George Washington said, Of all dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion, and morality, these are indispensable supports. One party platform cites that quotation. The other does not. One party platform promises a pledge to safeguard religious institutions against government control. The other doesn't. And actually threatens religious freedom by pledging, we will reverse discriminatory bans and policies that deny protection to groups based on religion or sexual orientation. One party platform supports the appointment of judges who respect traditional family values and sanctity of innocent human life. The other does not. One party platform says strong families depending upon God and one another advance the cause of liberty and lessen the need for government in our daily lives. The other does not. One party platform defines marriage exclusively as joining one man with one woman, does not accept the Supreme Court's recent redefinition of marriage, and urges its reversal. The other does not. One party platform endorses legislation that will bar government discrimination against individuals and businesses for acting on the belief that marriage is the union of one man and one woman. The other contrastingly says we will reject the use of broad religious exemptions to allow businesses, medical providers, social service agencies, and others to discriminate. Alarmingly, the and others includes churches. One party platform proclaims we value the right of America's churches, pastors, and religious liberties le leaders to preach and speak freely according to their faith. The other declares that they believe that freedom of religion is a fundamental human right, but we will never use protection of that right as a cover for discrimination. Warning, they are coming after churches. One party platform states they believe the federal government, especially the IRS, is constitutionally prohibited from policing or censoring the speech of America's churches, pastors, and religious leaders. 
The other warns we support a progressive vision of religious freedom that respects pluralism and rejects the misuse of religion to discriminate. Warning, they're coming after churches. Now, in conclusion, let's take a closer look. Both party platforms mention Bill of Rights three times. While one is referring to the U.S. Constitution's Bill of Rights in each instance, the other refers to a homeowner and renter Bill of Rights, Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights, Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, without ever referencing the U.S. Constitution's Bill of Rights at all. Take another closer look. Both party platforms mention convictions two times. While one mentions religious convictions and ethical convictions, the other only mentions challenging prisoner convictions and expunging criminal convictions. One party platform believes in sanctity of human life, that we should not use government funds to abort, and mentions adoption six times. The other believes abortion should be available for the full nine months, that we should use taxpayer funds to put pressure on other nations to also provide abortion, and mentions adoption just one time. One party platform believes that sanctity of life is an inalienable right, opposes euthanasia, and assisted suicide. The other does not. Let's take yet another closer look. The party platform mentioning inalienable rights 10 times says the Constitution's guarantee that no one can be deprived of life, liberty, or property deliberately echoes the Declaration of Independence's proclamation that all are endowed by their creator with an inalienable right to life. It adds, accordingly, we assert the sanctity of human life and affirm that the unborn child has a fundamental right to life which cannot be infringed. The other party platform does not mention inalienable rights at all in their new 2020 platform. You'd have to go back to their 2016 platform to find the only mention of an inalienable right, a made-up so-called inalienable right to vote. My conclusion, one party platform values votes over life. Which party best represents our biblical values today? Ecclesiastes 10.2 says, A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. The bottom line, we are not for the elephant, we are not for the donkey, we are for the lamb. We are christ Acraticans. So when you step into that voting booth, remember, politics and elections are about right versus left. Pulpits and biblical vo voters are about right versus long. You can find this transcript at biblicalvoter.com. May God bless you to be a biblical voter, to help make America godly again, so that once more we can confidently say, God bless. Bless America. Well, my name is Matthew Bellis. I'm uh, with here uh, Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, Congressman Bob McEwen, and Pastor Jim Garlow. And I want to ask you all, after just hearing what we just heard from Art Hodges, uh, can we separate the politician, the policies, and the party? Congresswoman. Well, as was stated by Art Hodges, the politicians follow their platforms, mm. and that's why it's imperative that we know. For instance, it, it, as was mentioned, in the platforms, God is mentioned as a noun 15 times in the Republican Party platform. It is mentioned once in the Democrat Party platform, and that's as an adjective. That yeah. tells us something. But the Democrat Party platform does mention LGBTQ 55 times, so we know their priorities. Bob McEwen, what would you say? You, you as a politician, would you want to be separated from your party and just known as a politician yourself? Well, uh, there's, a, there's a difference between the parties. And uh, if a person uh, is not familiar with a religion, for example, they could say religions are all alike or something. But the more you begin to know about something, the more educated you are. And the, the politics are entirely different. One, one views them as, as a force. They're the standard. They, they're the ones that uh, decide what is right. Says, uh, Nancy Pelosi walked up and grabbed the podium. She said, today, we're going to create a right to health care. Well, if a government can create a right, it can do away with a right. Mm. And that there's a term for that. It's called tyranny. Yeah. Uh, we believe that our nation's rights came from God. So that is why the godly part of it is so significant, because it's either relying upon the individual or upon God. That's what made America what it is, this tremendous effort by the opposition to abandon God. Uh, when they tried to add it to the, to the platform three times ago, they shouted down, so they, they want to be the God, and that's, that's why it makes a difference. Pastor Garlow, can you be a Christian crat, I believe is what the word was? I would encourage every person who considers himself a follower of Jesus, lay the Bible on the table, print out the Democratic platform, the Republican platform, read through them, mm. and decide which one squares with Scripture. Now, if they don't have time to do that, 
Go to Mm wellversedworld.org, and there we have a summary of the top 22 topics and an actual word from the Democratic platform with pagination, actual pages numbered, then the Republican platform with pagination, a third column, relevant scriptures that pertain to that topic. They can go to wellversedworld.org and click on comparison of the Democratic-Republican platform. My advocacy is not for either platform. It's for the scripture. That being the case, since we're Jesus followers and the scripture is authoritative, then you say, you say which one of these two platforms comes the closest to conforming with the reality of Scripture. Thank you very much, panel. I'm Matthew Bellis, and you have been well This is Jonathan Kahn. We are standing at a most critical moment. In a short time, America will be deciding its future. It is undoubtedly the most pivotal election of our lifetime. And never in our lifetime has this nation been as divided as it is now. We're standing at a crossroad and a precipice. We will either extend a window of time, an extension of grace to return to God, or we will shut that window and seal our nation's departure, its fall, its apostasy, and its progression to judgment. Beyond that, as America enters this election, it is so profoundly divided that the very fabric that holds it together is now in danger of unraveling. Those of you who have read The Harbinger know of the biblical template of national judgment that first comes a strike on the land, and then a span of years for the nation to return to God. We have been in that window of time since 9-11. In 2019, I saw the signs that the window was in danger of ending, and that 2020 would be a year of great shakings and dark events, and that the dynamic of judgment spoken of in the Harbinger would resume. That's why I knew I had to write the Harbinger too to warn of where it was all going. And now we're approaching the moment of decision. In regard to the critical issues, the choice has never been this stark. We have one platform and one agenda that aims to uphold the life of the unborn. And we have another that has pledged to expand their murder, to strike down every restraint on their murder, and to compel every taxpaying American to participate in their murder by paying for it. We have one platform and one agenda that seeks to uphold biblical morality concerning marriage, gender, sexuality, and another that has pledged to advance a radical agenda against the Word of God. We have one platform and one agenda that seeks to protect the right of parents to educate their children according to their choice and God's Word, and another that seeks to remove that right and force the indoctrination of our children against the ways of God. We have one platform and one agenda that seeks to protect religious freedom against that which would seek to end it, and another that threatens to eliminate it. It's not an exaggeration that if the second agenda and party take control of the government, it will ultimately mean that the existence of Christian schools, colleges, education, ministries, and churches will be endangered. It will mean the blood of the unborn will be free-flowing, and with your forced participation, with your hands covered with blood. It will mean the enshrinement of evil as good and of good as evil. It will ultimately mean the persecution of God's people and the sealing of the judgment of this nation. So I have three things to say, and I say them not as representing any ministry or congregation, but simply as a watchman. Number one, it's not about people, personalities, or parties. It's about the issues. And the issues could not be any more clear or stark. If you cast your vote for an agenda that means that one more drop of blood, the blood of the unborn, will be shed, your hands will be covered with that blood. If you cast your vote for an agenda that will work toward the ending of religious freedom and the gospel going forth, that advances what is clearly against the Word of God, and opposes that which is of the Word of God, and indoctrinates our children to do likewise, then I cannot see how you will not be complicit in and partaking of the ushering in of darkness and subject to the judgment of God that is to come in this life and in eternity. Number two, if you are a child of God and you do nothing to stop the darkness, then you are as the watchman who sees the sword coming and stays silent. 
God says their blood shall be upon your head. You are the light of the world. If you do not shine your light into the darkness, then you cease to be that light. If you have the chance to vote for light and against the darkness, and you do not, then how will you not be held accountable and responsible for what happens next? You will also stand before God, and on that day you do not want their blood to be upon your head. Do what you have to do. Vote to defend the defenseless, to save the lives of the unborn. Vote for the gospel to go forth, for the window to remain open, for the next generation, for the good, for the ways of God. And number three, no matter who you are, this moment, November 3rd, will be critical in determining the future of America and the world. Beyond voting at the ballot box, the most powerful thing you can do, we can do, is to vote with our prayers in the presence of God. Therefore, I am compelled to call for a day of prayer and fasting on the exact day, November 3rd, 2020. November 3rd is election day. Let us also make November 3rd God's Day, the day of prayer and fasting. Millions of us joined together on the day of the return one month ago, according to 2 Chronicles 7.14. And in movements of prayer since then, let us now commit to seal it all on November 3rd. Spread the word. Tell your friends. Tell your pastors. Commit that day in your homes, on your jobs, in your churches, in your fellowships, to humble yourself, humble ourselves to pray and to seek his face and to turn from our evil ways, that he will hear from heaven and answer our prayers. Let us pray that in all these things the will of God be done and that he will elect to government those of his choosing and that no matter what, no matter what it takes, that revival will come to this land. We look at our country and polling shows that more than three-fourths of the nation thinks that we're headed in the wrong direction. The approval numbers for all three branches of government have plummeted. We need to see some significant changes. I think we're probably all familiar with 2 Chronicles 7.14. This is the well-known passage in which God promises that if we, who are called by His name, will humble ourselves and pray and seek His face and turn from our wicked ways, that He will hear from heaven and heal our land. Certainly, America's health and healing starts with prayer. Earlier generations definitely understood this. In fact, by 1815, there had been over 1,400 government-issued calls to prayer in America. In fact, John Hancock himself personally issued 22 prayer proclamations such as this one. But John Hancock understood that prayer by itself wasn't enough, that we couldn't just stop with prayer. As he admonished citizens in his day, I urge you, by all that is dear, by all that is honorable, by all that is sacred, not only that you pray, but that you act. We must seek God and appeal to Him for help, but then we must also do everything we can to make a difference. Remember 2 Chronicles 7.14? We're to pray? But it also says that we're to turn from our wicked ways, and that includes our inactivity and non-involvement, our sitting on the sidelines, particularly with regard to what goes on in our government. This is part of the wicked ways from which American Christians in particular must turn. We have to pray and rely on God, but we also have to take action. This is what made America free in the first place. When the American Revolution began, we had no major assets of our own. We'd been British colonies our entire existence, and now we're going to take on the greatest military power in the world with only our fledgling resources? Britain had a formidable navy. They ruled the seas. So what are we supposed to do with that? Well, we could build our own navy, but in the early years, we didn't even have a national government, and so there's no way to fund a navy. But fortunately, in 1775, still almost a year before the Declaration of Independence, George Washington stepped up as an individual and personally commissioned six cruisers. Of course, those six ships from George Washington weren't much compared to the scores of ships in Britain's navy, but that's what we had. 
And back then, all the ships in a nation's navy flew their flag openly and visibly so that their fellow ships could avoid the friendly fire and not sink the wrong ships. So the British had their flag, but not the Americans. We're brand new. We don't even have a national flag yet. So how are we going to recognize our fellow ships? No problem. We'll create our first flag. And according to official records, it was a flag with a white background, a pine tree in the middle, and it included the motto, Appeal to Heaven. This was our first flag, and it flew on our Navy. A year later, after the Declaration was signed, the state of Massachusetts built its own state Navy, and this was also adopted as the official flag for their Navy. And then the Massachusetts Army adopted a flag for its ground forces, and it had a similar motto, an appeal to God. As these official mottos and declarations and flags indicate, we openly relied on God. But we didn't stop there. That was just the first step. As John Hancock had urged, we prayed and we acted. This same combination of prayer and action remained a no-brainer for American Christians for generations afterwards. In fact, a century and a half after the Revolution, Teddy Roosevelt penned this book, Fear God and Take Your Own Part. As Teddy explained, but in addition to fearing God, it is necessary that we should be able and ready to take our own part. The man who cannot take his own part is a nuisance in the community, a source of weakness, an encouragement to wrongdoers, and an added burden to the men who wish to do what is right. If he cannot take his own part, then somebody else has to take it for him. There is no reason that God-fearing Christians should be a burden to anyone else, especially to the nation in general. We need to step up and carry our weight. As God-fearing people, we have a voice, and we also have overwhelming numbers. But if we continue to remain silent and uninvolved, we'll have no one to blame for the godless outcome but ourselves. We need to recruit good people to run for office, or even run for office ourselves. We need to speak out about what's going on around us, but we absolutely, definitely, unequivocally must vote. That's not optional. Voting is not a right, it's a duty. And we will answer to God for what we do or what we don't do with our vote. So we do have to appeal to God, but we also have to take action. And now is the time that we must get involved. Biblical voters know that the God of the Bible is a God of moral absolutes which are non-negotiable. The first sentence in the Declaration of Independence emphatically establishes that American exceptionalism is predicated and dependent upon being a nation founded on the laws of nature and of nature's God. We're seeing the tragic results of a nation that still claims to rely on the laws of nature, modern terminology reflecting this is science and data, while no longer relying on the laws of nature's God. In fact, removing prayer and the Bible from schoolhouses to state houses, just as there were five pillars at the entrance of the Old Testament tabernacle that God gave Moses and the children of Israel, there are five moral pillars that should guide every voter as they enter the voting booth. They are these. Number one, life. Biblical voters cannot conscientiously vote for a candidate who supports abortion, euthanasia, or embryonic stem cell research. Scripture teaches that all human life is sacred. Abortion is the killing of a human life in what should be its safest sanctuary, the womb of his or her mother. In fact, did you know that no creature in the animal kingdom kills its own unborn in the womb? Only sinful humans do this. Euthanasia assists in ending a life. Embryonic stem cell research utilizes aborted baby parts. Look at Leviticus 17.11 or Job 31.15, Jeremiah 1.5. The Bible's full of helpful references. Second pillar is marriage. The Bible emphatically declares that marriage is only to be between one man and one woman. Jesus affirmed this and said this has always been the case from God's creation, the very beginning of time. Biblical voters must vote only for candidates who affirm their belief in and support for 
the biblical definition of natural marriage and who will oppose same-sex marriage. See Matthew 19, 4 through 6. Now, the third pillar is sexuality. God made us male or female. Your gender and sex are one and the same as determined by Almighty God at conception and revealed to all at birth. Thinking oneself to be a different gender or sex doesn't make it so. Scripture says that those who don't retain God in their knowledge become fools, though they think themselves wise. Any sexual activity outside of the bounds of marriage between one man and one woman is unacceptable to God. Biblical voters must vote for candidates who support maintaining the biological distinction between male and female and keeping sex within natural marriage. See Genesis 1.27, Romans 1, and so forth. The fourth pillar is religious liberty. The principal reason America was founded as a new nation was for people to be able to worship the God of the Bible freely without government interference. The first guarantee of the Bill of Rights in the United States Constitution is no law will be made respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Vote for the candidate who will best support and defend our unalienable religious liberties. Thank God for Acts 5.29 and Romans 13.1. The fifth pillar is Israel. Whoever blesses Israel will be blessed. Whoever curses Israel will be cursed. These are national as well as individual consequences ensconced in Scripture. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Biblical voters will vote for the candidates who will best support Israel. See Psalm 122, verse number 6. Now, if you've not already, please be sure to vote in alignment with these biblical moral pillars. Life, marriage, sexuality, religious liberty, and Israel. You and I can be a force that is needed in our nation to see that we've done our due diligence as salt and light to preserve and to illuminate the world around us at this very dark and crucial time. Let your voice be heard. Thank you so much for listening today. Let us proudly stand and go.